finding success in the music industry is notoriously difficult, and some extremely well-known musicians nearly miss their big break. From the golden age of rock and roll to the heyday of grunge, these are the rock stars who almost weren't in the bands that made them famous. The names John, Paul, George, and Ringo are eternally linked as the Beatles, the biggest and most iconic band in music history. Aside from their stellar songwriting and musicianship, part of the band's mystique was each member's distinct identity. Paul was the cute one, John the smart one, Ringo the funny one, and George the quiet one. However, the young John Lennon almost made an unwise move that would have changed music history. Had he gone with his first instinct, George Harrison, the band's guitarist and spiritual center, would have been left out of the Beatles' incredible musical journey. As recounted by Ultimate Classic Rock, Lennon initially thought that Harrison, with his baby face, looked way too young to be in the band that would become the Beatles. Early in 1958, Lennon and Paul McCartney were looking to expand the sound of their group, the Quarrymen, with another guitarist. McCartney suggested that his schoolmate, 14-year-old George Harrison, should join the band. Despite a flawless impromptu performance with the Bill Justice hit Raunchy, Lennon initially balked at the idea, saying that the youthful guitarist looked even more like a child than McCartney. Luckily, there must have been a voice in Lennon's head that helped him overcome his superficial first impression of Harrison. There's more here than meets the eye. In an interview featured in the documentary film The Beatles Anthology, Lennon states that it was Harrison's musical skills that finally won him over. With Harrison on board, the essential elements of the Beatles were in place. Just four years later, the band from Liverpool would release their first single, Love Me Do, sparking the worldwide phenomenon of Beatlemania. Harrison would go on to write and sing some of the Beatles' most memorable tracks, including Taxman and Here Comes the Sun. He also helped push their ever-evolving sound to new and unexpected places. Nirvana bassist Chris Novoselic has remained mostly absent from the music scene following band leader Kurt Cobain's 1994 death. Nevertheless, he was an integral part of the iconic grunge act during its inception and throughout three central studio albums. Things might have turned out much differently had tensions between Cobain and Novoselic escalated and an offer from an established Seattle band lured the bassist away from Nirvana. In an excerpt from his memoir, Sing Backwards and Weep, Screaming Trees vocalist Mark Lanigan recalls how he nearly poached Novoselic for his own group. Lanigan was invited to see a gig featuring an unknown band whose singer was a big fan of Screaming Trees. That band turned out to be Nirvana, and the singer was Kurt Cobain. Before Nirvana played a single note, Lanigan was already taken by Novoselic's imposing 6-foot 7-inch frame and punk rock attitude. Lanigan recalled his initial impressions of Novoselic in his book, he wrote, Upon seeing this enormous guy tuning up, my first thought was, here's my bass player. I began to formulate a plan to steal him away from this band I'd not even heard yet. A few weeks after the performance, Lanigan received a phone call from Novoselic inquiring if Screaming Trees still needed a bass player. Nirvana's bass man was reaching his limit with the band. Blown away by Nirvana's fully formed vision, however, Lanigan encouraged Novoselic to stick with Cobain. And he was right. In 1991, Nirvana released the album Nevermind, featuring the song Smells Like Teen Spirit. The landscape of popular music was immediately changed and the band quickly earned a spot in rock and roll history. Rock fans may argue which incarnation of Van Halen was best, but everyone agrees that the band's classic lineup will forever be remembered for two things, the blazing fretboard acrobatics of guitarist Edward Van Halen and his flamboyant motormouth frontman David Lee Roth. Famous for his unrelenting charisma, spandex-clad form, and high-flying stage moves, Roth's many talents actually had little to do with his inclusion in Van Halen. According to the Herald Wig, the younger singer unsuccessfully auditioned for the band, then known as Mammoth, several times between 1972 and 1974. Mammoth was packed with talent but low on gear, and they would often rent Roth's PA system for the sum of $50 per show. Eddie Van Halen, eager to leave singing behind to concentrate on the guitar, at last relented, saving both his voice and the rental fee. Roth got a call that he and his PA system were in the band. At his suggestion, the Van Halen brothers dropped the Mammoth moniker and adopted their surname for the group. In 1978, Van Halen released its self-titled debut and would quickly make the transition from the Los Angeles club scene to huge arenas around the country. The original lineup of Eddie and Alex Van Halen, bassist Michael Anthony, and Roth would last until internal tensions led to the singer's ouster and replacement with Sammy Hagar in the mid-80s. One of the most iconic San Francisco acts to rise from the psychedelic scene of the late 1960s was Jefferson Airplane, fronted by the outspoken Grace Slick. Although Slick, the singer of such 60s staples as White Rabbit and Somebody to Love, was actually a replacement. 
When the band's original singer, Signe Anderson, became pregnant and decided to leave the music business, Slick seemed like the perfect person for the job. I sort of knew their material, so it was a logical change from one band to another. However, Slick wasn't the first person the band members considered to be their new singer. During Anderson's tenure, Jefferson Airplane hewed closer to folk rock than psychedelia. Their initial choice to replace her, Sherry Snow of the folk duo Blackburn and Snow, would have likely maintained the band's softer direction. When Snow declined, they brought in an old friend from the club scene, Hard Edge Slick of the band The Great Society. Slick, looking for a group that took music as seriously as she did, jumped at the chance, bringing with her the attitude that made Jefferson Airplane superstars. As lyricist and drummer of Canadian prog rockers Rush, the late Neil Peart encompassed the soul and vision of the band. Yet, according to Ultimate Classic Rock, Rush's virtuoso percussionist could have easily missed his chance at stardom, had bandmates Getty Lee and Alex Lifeson gone with their first impressions. By 1974, Rush had released his first album and had a modest radio hit in the States with a single working man, but they had just parted ways with drummer John Rutsey. Enter the warrior, Neil Peart. Driving not a fiery chariot drawn by mighty steeds, but his mom's Ford Pinto to the audition. As recounted in the 2010 documentary Beyond the Lighted Stage, both Lee and Lifeson had similar thoughts about the young drummer. It's kind of goofy. I remember thinking, God, he's not, he's not nearly cool enough to be in this band. However, when Peart sat behind the drum kit and started playing, Lee and Lifeson immediately reevaluated their opinion of the 21 year old. Peart blew them away with a power and complexity that they knew Rush was missing. Officially joining the band in July of 1974, Peart made his recording debut as drummer and lyricist on Rush's second album, Fly By Night, solidifying the band's signature sound. Quitting was never an option for ACDC following the death of their hard-partying lead singer Bon Scott in 1980. Although the band made a triumphant comeback with replacement singer Brian Johnson and the release of their multi-platinum album, Back in Black, less than a year after Scott's passing, Johnson was never a shoe-in for the gig. At least two contenders were in the running before Johnson filled Scott's legendary shoes. In an interview with British music site Soundchecks, Naughty Holder of the 1970s glam act Slade recounted being approached by ACDC as a possible replacement. Yes, it's true. I was approached. ACDC did offer me the job, and I turned it down. So they went and got a guy from the band Jordy, Brian Johnson, who sounded exactly like me anyway. According to Blabbermouth, Bon Scott sounded like Mark Storacci of the Swiss heavy metal band Crocus was also approached for the gig, but he turned it down because of his loyalty to his own group. Storacci later said, Yes, I was considered. I wasn't interested at all. I was happy in Switzerland. Crocus started just to break through internationally, even in the United States. Ultimately, Angus Young and company made the right choice in Johnson, whose gravelly screech became a trademark element of the band's bigger-than-life sound. Any headbanger worth their leather and studs will tell you that heavy metal as we know it was pioneered by British doom merchants Black Sabbath. Although many may think of it as Ozzy Osbourne's band, the architect of Black Sabbath's wall of sonic sludge has always been Riffmaster Tony Iommi. The guitarist's work-related accident, which cost him the tips of his fingers on his fretting hand, is the stuff of rock legend. Less well-known, however, is the fact that he briefly left the band that would become Sabbath for the high-concept hard rock outfit Jethro Tull. When I only broke the news to Ozzy and the band, he got an unexpected response. So I told the rest of the guys, I said, uh, you know, they've asked me to join them, you know. They went, you should go for it. I went, oh, thanks. Feeling out of place, Iommi longed for the camaraderie of his old band and left Jethro Tull after a handful of rehearsals and an appearance on the Rolling Stones TV special, which was unseen for many years. Iommi doesn't regret his time in Tull because it ultimately made the future Black Sabbath a stronger band. According to Guitar World, Iommi states that he learned some important lessons from Jethro Tull frontman Ian Anderson, namely professionalism and a serious work ethic. Iommi said, I learned that you've got to work at it. When I came back to the band, I made sure everybody was up early in the morning and rehearsing. I said to them, this is how we have got to do it because this is how Jethro Tull did it. Of course, the other members of Black Sabbath had their own priorities and schedules. It's a bit difficult because Guy's never used to get up till about 11 anyway. And I was the only one that could drive, so it was me that had to go and pick everybody up. If Jimmy Page's first pick of singer had joined the band, Led Zeppelin as we know it would never have existed. It's difficult to imagine, but Page's original vision did not include strutting golden god Robert Plant. 
According to Rolling Stone, Page considered Steve Marriott of the Small Faces before asking singer-songwriter Terry Reid of the Jaywalkers to join the burgeoning group. Reed, however, was more interested in following his muse as a solo performer and suggested that Page seek out a 19-year-old singer named Robert Plant. Although Reed has gone down in music history as a singer that turned down Led Zeppelin, he has no regrets. Among his cult of devoted followers is shock rocker and film director Rob Zombie. In addition to loving his music, Zombie prominently featured some of Reed's songs in a couple of his movies, including The Devil's Rejects. Following the tragic death of drummer John Bono, Page and Plant disbanded Led Zeppelin in 1980. However, the band's popularity has never waned, and through the years, it has gathered generations of new fans. And luckily for everyone, Plant was the man behind the mic. Beloved for its soaring harmonies and catchy hooks, The Mamas and the Papas was one of the most successful folk rock acts of the 1960s. Led by singer-songwriter John Phillips, the vocal group included Phillips' wife Michelle, co-founder Denny Doherty, and the group's real star Cass Elliott. Noted for her incredible vocal range, Elliott was the last person to join the group despite her constant overtures to Phillips to become a member. Elliott was supposedly excluded from the band because Phillips' vocal arrangements were unsuited to her range, but she was eventually invited to join the group. However, as Legacy points out, the real reason for her late entry had nothing to do with her vocal range. It was an image-conscious John Phillips who had a problem with Elliot's weight. Fortunately, her talent trumped Phillips' prejudice against her size. Armed with Elliot's otherworldly voice, the group went on to have a string of hits, including California Dreamin' and Monday Monday. After the group split up, Elliot went on to a successful but tragically brief solo career. On July 29, 1974, Cass Elliott succumbed to heart failure, dying in her sleep at the age of 32. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about rock stars are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.